All right, we are going live now on YouTube. Good evening, everyone. I am Jyoti Prakash Datta, the co-founder of Team Lex Venues Inti. I am also a LLM candidate in National Law University, Odisha. I welcome you all to the 44th episode of Lex Venues Inti's Rendezvous series. So after a brief hiatus, we are today resuming our Rendezvous series with an eminent guest on board. So today we are joined by Mr. Avijit Chatterjee. He is a senior advocate at the Kolkata High Court. Sir, I welcome you on board for the interview session. Thank you for I'm joining us. I am honored. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. We are very much honored to have you, sir. Sir is a very Thank eminent you, advocate, as I said, uh, in the Kolkata High Court. Sir has also practiced before several other tribunals as well as courts all over India. He is also a practitioner before the Supreme Court of India. He has practiced and has uh, represented many clients uh, throughout the country as well as in many other uh, advisory matters. So without delaying any more time, I would request Devasis to come forward and take the first phase of questions. And uh, I will ask every participant to stay tuned with us and to enjoy and to learn from the life and legacy of our honorable guest, Mr. Avijit Chatterjee, sir. Devasis, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jyoti Prakash. Uh, so with the due permission of sir, I would like to begin with uh, the first phase of the interview session. And in the second yes. phase, Jyoti Prakash will join. Please go ahead. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, so the very uh, first question that we would like to know from you is about your childhood, uh, your family background and schooling, sir. Uh, well, uh, I was born into a middle class educated family with a strong value system. Uh, my family, my father, I'm of course the only child of my parents. My father and my entire family are have always been self-effacing and have led a very simple uh, lifestyle. Uh, I had a normal childhood and I attended South Point High School from the very beginning, the nursery classes right up to class 11 when I passed out uh, after sitting for the higher secondary examination. In our times, 10 plus 2 was not there. It was 11, a consolidated 11, class 11 uh, course uh, for the higher secondary examinations, which I uh, duly passed in the year 1975 from South Point High School. That's quite amazing to know about your childhood and family background, sir. Uh, now, coming straight away to uh, your uh, law career, sir, we would like to know that uh, at what age you decided to law and who inspired you to take up law as a career? Yes, the decision to pursue law as a career uh, was taken by me midway through my undergraduate course in the Bachelor of Commerce, which I was pursuing in St. Xavier's College in Calcutta University with honors in advanced accountancy. Uh, I developed a very strong liking for the commercial law paper, the company law paper. Uh, and there I decided I was in two minds as to whether to go for the profession of a chartered accountant or the profession of a lawyer. But I found that the chartered, as a chartered accountant, I would be confined to a particular area of practice and to certain fora. Uh, but as a lawyer, I can practice taxation, I can practice company law, I can practice commercial law and in all the fora. So there really I took the decision, say around 1978 or something like that, that uh, I would take up law as a career. But if you ask me who inspired me, that I have to go back a little in point of time. Uh, when I was about 11 or 12 years or maybe 13 years old, I must tell you that my maternal grandfather was a criminal lawyer in the Howrah District Court in West Bengal. And my maternal uncle was also a lawyer. Of course, my maternal great-grandfather was also a lawyer, but I didn't see him. Uh, now, I recall that uh, when I used to be at my maternal uncle's house during summer vacations of school, uh, my maternal grandfather would uh, make over to me 
uh, his dockets of criminal matters. Uh, and sometimes I would also ask for the same, just to go through the facts. As you know, criminal cases are all based on very interesting facts. And I would ask him questions as to what can be the possible role of the accused. My grandfather was uh, basically a defense lawyer. And then I would, uh, over the years, you know, I would uh, put some suggestions to him that why can't you do like this? Why can't you do like that? And I saw, uh, to my surprise, that he started taking them very seriously. So, you know, whenever I was in vacation, he would himself approach me and say that go through it and tell me uh, uh, how the matter should be approached so far as cross-examination and other things are concerned. Then my maternal uncle had a very good very rich law library in my maternal uncle's house. So I would, uh, you know, somehow uh, spend hours uh, going through the law journals, uh, going through the facts of the cases, because I didn't understand too much of law at that point of time. Uh, but uh, whenever a new journal would arrive, say a current issue or latest issue of the All India Reporter, I would go through it. Uh, that was a, the process, you know, uh, uh, of my getting involved in the thing. Then my father, who was, of course, not strictly in the legal field, but he was at one point of time, in, uh, he, he was with the Legal Remembrances Office of the Government of West Bengal, which is housed in the High Court premises. So he has seen a lot of judges and lawyers, both British judges in the pre-independence period, British lawyers, and also Indian lawyers. So he also would narrate certain stories and uh, he also had uh, some interest in law because I remember uh, him whenever he was, he would go to my maternal uncle's house he would discuss uh, law points you know from journals with my maternal uncle and my maternal grandfather so that was the atmosphere which perhaps you know inspired me and I found gradually got attracted to it I go through the AIR manuals for uh, taking up a taking up a particular section uh, of some statute and go through the cases. Uh, so, and my father was also very close to an uncle of mine who later became a judge of the Calcutta High Court. Although, for a very brief period, because he died in office, Justice Bhutosh Banerjee, uh, he was, he became a judge. Now, my father was very close to him, so. They used to have their uh, sessions in the evening over tea and uh, they would discuss a lot of law and, you know, in the process, he knew a lot of uh, district court judges and uh, I also bumped into many of them we, whom I used to call uncles and uh, all that, you know. So the total scenario, uh, the total uh, atmosphere uh, inspired me to join the legal profession. That's quite interesting to know how uh, the environment in your family uh, compelled or inspired you to take up law as a career. And we can see that you have excelled a lot in that. Uh, now you. coming, yes, sir. Now coming down to uh, your alma mater, sir. So in which college you have uh, taken up uh, your law degree and how was your college? And if you could tell us uh, something on that. Um. I did my law from the University College of Law, Hajra Road campus. Of course, in our times, the LLB degree was a three-year course. It was not a five-year course. Uh, so far as my experience is concerned, you can say that uh, it is a mixed experience. I must confess that the infrastructure in those days in law colleges was not up to the desired standard. Uh, we did not have very good teachers in all the disciplines, but uh, in some of the disciplines, we had very good teachers. Uh, so it was a mixed bag. Um, then from the point of view of students, uh, you know, people used to come to law uh, who were not very serious about pursuing law later. We had as our uh, college mates a number of elderly people who were, you know, uh, employed elsewhere and uh, was pursuing law either as a, uh, as, as a pastime or, you know, to do something post-retirement or something like that. 
So all, it was not that all youngsters were there in the college. So it was a mixed experience. But then uh, I remember that uh, at least in our batch, uh, there were quite a number of uh, students uh, and of course, helped by the faculty uh, who organized debates, seminars and symposia uh, on various aspects. And we used to go out to other uh, you know, institutions for participating in debates. Uh, we have represented our college in uh, the, I remember in the Alipur Bar Association, there was some debate regarding the justification of death penalty. And uh, I represented along with uh, a lady batchmate of mine, uh, we represented our college. And uh, in the speaker's category, merit, merit, merit wise, you know, she won the gold medal and I won the silver medal. So uh, it was interesting. Uh, we made it interesting by persuading the faculty to help us to, uh, you know, uh, take up meaningful activities connected with law. So uh, it was a good experience, but I would say that I would prefer uh, that in law colleges, there is more seriousness and a better faculty, which of course is now there because it's a five-year course and it's a whole time course and everybody uh, is more or less serious. All right, sir. That was... Uh quite great to know about your law school and uh, how was it at that time and which has immensely changed uh, by the time now over the right. years. Right. Uh, uh, now, sir, as you said initially that uh, you were quite fascinated by commercial law, uh, company law and all yeah. that. So we would like to know that uh, whether that changed after joining law school or it was the same when you joined law school and graduated. Um. Uh, no, uh, you know, in, in college or law school, I uh, took a deep interest in, apart from the fields you mentioned, I took a, a, a deep interest in administrative law, which we were taught by a very good uh, teacher, and constitutional law, which I had not dabbled in before. And uh, you can say my area of interest extended to those fields, as well as public international law, which again was taught by a very good professor. So I believe his teaching, you know, was a catalyst for my uh, developing an interest in the field of public international law. Although, uh, you know, from the point of view of a legal professional, public international law, as you know, is called the vanishing point of jurisprudence. But uh, even then, I was quite fascinated by the laws of the high seas and the territorial waters and the maritime zones and the collision cases, what happens when two ships collide on the high seas and which flag, uh, flag of which country each ship is flying and therefore, you know, all those nitty gritties and maritime conventions and all that. Then, uh, you know, war law, like how do you treat uh, prisoners of war and all that, Geneva Convention, other conventions. So I developed an interest in that field also. But uh, I really uh, utilized my interest uh, in administrative law and constitutional law later in my legal profession, apart from commercial law, company law. Indeed, sir. Also, you rightly pointed out that uh, a good teacher, a good teacher in a law school can change your perspective or interest uh, yes. from one subject to another subject as rightly yes. happened with you from commercial yes. law and another to public interest yes. law and administrative constitutional law. Right. That's quite great to know, sir. Uh, now, sir, as we have discussed about initial phase of your life, we would like to know that uh, in which year you have joined the bar and uh, how was your initial, how were your initial days at the bar? and under whom uh, you had practiced and anything connected to that aspect you would like to say? Yes. Uh, I got formally enrolled as an advocate with the Bar Council of West Bengal on 16th of December, 1983. Uh, but I must tell you that even prior to my formal enrollment, I had started attending the chambers of my senior 
Mr. Bhaskar Prasad Gupta, who later practiced in the Supreme Court of India also. Uh, he is a senior advocate and uh, he uh, did his LLB from the University College London, University College London, and he was called to the bar from the Lincoln's Inn. And uh, I used to attend his chambers right from 1981, before I was enrolled. Uh, that worked tremendously for me. Because by the time I was formally enrolled, I was quite accustomed with uh, the nitty gritties of the legal profession. I knew a lot of persons by that time who would come to my senior's chamber to brief him. And I had worked on briefs, uh, actually litigation briefs, which were in which he was briefed. He would, you know, uh, indulge me by handing over the docket to me and saying that you prepare the first note and first uh, you know, your views, give me your views on the matter in writing. And even for drafting matters, he would say, you you prepare the first draft informally. I was not briefed, uh, but then he would delegate that work to me. And that worked perfectly for me. And uh, apart from that, he is a very, very methodical person, very knowledgeable and erudite, but, uh, you know, very calm and composed, not the one to get excited but a uh, very good teacher and a very good uh, person also. So, you know, uh, I really enjoyed his tutelage. Uh, so far as the challenges in the profession are concerned, that is, uh, of course, uh, I'm a first generation lawyer, so to say, so far as the Calcutta High Court is concerned. And therefore, uh, you know, I had to tackle the initial challenges, like, you know, uh, people would know me before they approach me with a brief. I wouldn't know most of the judges personally. They were all, you know, alien people to me. But as I said, that my acquaintance with my senior, Mr. Bhaskar Gupta, from since 1981, and I was enrolled in 1983, helped me in that area also. Because, you know, I... Uh, was quite used to the environment because I, I used to attend court also, you know, uh, without robes, of course. I was not enrolled and I was still studying. But you, I used to attend court also. Uh, uh, having worked on the dockets, I would uh, hear him argue the matters and how the other side responds and how he responds. So um, challenges will be there but uh, and were there for me. But uh, then uh, I think that uh, the challenges I could overcome uh, because of his guidance, of course, guidance and blessings of some other senior lawyers also uh, to whom I am indebted. Uh, I must make a mention of a few of them. I have worked very closely with uh, uh, the former speaker of the Lok Sabha, Mr. Somnath Chatterjee. Uh, in the Supreme Court as well as in the Calcutta High Court. He was an excellent, uh, brilliant legal mind. And uh, I enjoyed working with him and learned a lot. Uh, then uh, I have worked very, very closely with another senior counsel of Calcutta High Court, uh, who is, of course, not there anymore, Mr. Vishwaru Gupta, who had a very, very uh, good knowledge and a thorough knowledge of law whenever I remember I would get stuck with some point and uh, help was not nearby. I would give him a call and he would just reel off the cases to me. So I was able to overcome the challenges through that process. But God was kind to me that I did not have to wait too long for you know work to come and uh, my getting involved in the profession. Uh, well, I had to wait for six, seven months. But after that, you know, gradually I was very comfortable and uh, I, I, work came my way. So the process started. Very rightly said, sir. Everyone has uh, their share of uh, problems and how they overcome them uh, makes them great. So that was quite fascinating uh, anecdote or story of your life to know from you. And also, as you mentioned about Bhaskar Prasad Gupta, we have uh, uh, previously interviewed his nephew, Jaydeep Gupta, on our channel yes, as well. Yes. Jaydeep is a very good friend. Very good friend. Yes. Indeed, indeed, sir. 
moving on sir we would like to know that uh, what was your experience of your first case that you have argued yourself and uh, uh, how, what were the what were the anecdotes that you would like to share with us uh, anecdotes regarding the first case yes sir well the first case uh, which i have argued uh, seriously uh, was i remember a petition under section 397 and 398 of the as tried companies act 1986 for oppression and mismanagement against a big company in calcutta and uh, i was of course assisting some senior lawyers including mr bhaskar gupta but on that day uh, mr gupta was also held up somewhere and he didn't arrive couldn't arrive rather uh, and there was a very interesting and uh, very crucial point to be argued about the maintainability of the petition uh, as you know uh, these petitions for oppression and mismanagement which are filed you require the shareholder requires the minimum share qualification so the point was whether the petitioner in that case uh, fulfilled those share qualifications which were prescribed in the section 399 of the 1956 act uh, it was a very complicated legal point but uh, because uh, mr gupta was held up somewhere i had to argue the whole matter it was very challenging but i found it uh, very very satisfying and uh, of course i must acknowledge that i was encouraged by the judge also uh, who heard the matter and uh, because very senior and eminent counsel were opposing me on the other side uh, and uh, but uh, i successfully argued it uh, and got an interim stay of the proceedings so that is the first case i remember which i argued thoroughly and seriously uh, uh, fully rather and which gave me a lot of satisfaction before that of course i have appeared in a number of cases but i was uh, i had argued for some time somebody took over uh, and um, or i was assisting somebody another case i remember which is an arbitration matter where arbitration appeal which i argued uh, before a division bench uh, and i remember the judges also uh, and uh, uh, the judges were very I, I i was i think even more junior at that point of time and uh, the judges uh, appreciated me very much which uh, really encouraged me uh, from then on you know to uh, really prepare and argue a matter and uh, you know uh, arguing a matter has always been a very exciting thing from for me then on you know that uh, i have forgotten the cause title of this case but that was an arbitration appeal which uh, i had argued now not much of anecdotes in these two cases because these were quite serious matters and uh, nothing much happened but if you uh, are talking of anecdotes then uh, you know i can tell you some anecdotes in court proceedings to which i have been a witness uh sometimes involved in the proceedings sometimes from outside uh like you know sometimes uh, exchanges uh, between lawyers can also be very interesting i remember a matter was being argued before a division bench and uh, and two very senior counsel mr rc dev who was a doyen of the bar of the calcutta bar and mr shobhnath chatterjee were opposing each other now mr chatterjee was the chamber junior of mr rc dev and mr chatterjee started the arguments by promising the judge that he would take only 15 minutes now he took 20 minutes and when he concluded he told the judges that i had promised that i would uh, finish by 15 minutes but i have overshot my time i beg to be pardoned so he said that uh, i promised you but i could not keep it so mr dev would immediately stand up and respond because mr chatterjee was in politics he would say that politicians seldom do so that was uh, i thought a very very uh, uh, shows the presence of mind of the man 
you know, that he could uh, come up with that. Then there are many other anecdotes which I have heard. I have heard from my father also, uh, not always witnessed them, but heard about them. Like, you know, uh, some proceeding was go going on before some judge uh, in the Calcutta High Court. And the learned counsel who was addressing was a third generation lawyer. But uh, he, the judge somehow didn't uh, like uh, his arguments. He thought that he was wasting time or something like that. So the, at one point of time, the judge stopped him and said that your grandfather served as a subordinate judge under me. He had enough common sense. You were a, your father was a learned advocate of this court. He had some common sense, but I find nothing in you. <laughs> these are, you know, very, everybody bust, bursts into laughter. These are not taken seriously, but these are the anecdotes sometimes which fall from the judge and, uh, you know, the bench and the bar, they always, uh, they exchange these views. Like one senior counsel was uh, requesting for an adjournment of a matter for a week. Uh, the judge said that you have to uh, pay costs. So the council said that since your lordship is putting me on terms, make it a fortnight instead of a week. So the judge said very well double the costs. So the council retorted that uh, am I to take it my lord that justice is being priced as in the lion's range which is the stock exchange. <laughs> so these are uh, anecdotes which are very rich. So if somebody writes a book I think uh, you know it will run into volumes. These are the anecdotes which come to my mind right now. <laughs> there are many more, but then time is limited. Absolutely, sir. Uh, also, these anecdotes were quite interesting to know. And I am sure that me and Jyoti Prakash and our viewers uh, will surely uh, take the fun out of them. All these anecdotes that you have said. Uh, now, sir, as you have named a number of uh, uh, senior advocates and doins uh, yeah. from the Kolkata bar when you joined the bar, uh, we would also like to know uh, other uh, senior advocates or doins of the bar whom you personally know or who have uh, put an impact on you from either our Supreme Court or from Kolkata High Court or any other court, sir. Yes, I'll come uh, court-wise. So far as Kolkata High Court is concerned, uh, we have seen uh, other doings of the bar, like in corporate law, uh, we had giants like Mr. S.B. Mukherjee, popularly known as Jolu Mukherjee, whose son is now the Advocate General of West Bengal, uh, and uh, Mr. R.C. Nag, Mr. P.C. Sen. They were all doings of company law. Uh, then my own senior is, of course, into constitutional law mainly and uh, some taxation also. Then uh, uh, we have seen uh, other eminent lawyers like uh, in the appellate side uh, dealing with uh, appeals from the subordinate judiciary uh, as also writ petitions, uh, Mr. Shaktinath Mukherjee, senior advocate. Uh, then on the civil side, Mr. Shama Prashanna Rai Choudhury and Mr. Shudish Das Gupta. All these people and their arguments in court, whether I worked with them or not, some of them, Mr. Mukherjee I have worked with, Mr. Nag I have worked with, Mr. Sen I have worked with, but there are many others whom, with, I, with whom I have not worked. But even, uh, even then, uh, their uh, performances in court or their way of addressing court or their um, knowledge of law uh, have all, you know, benefited me, and uh, I have, uh, I have uh, uh, benefited to a large extent from watching their performances in court. In taxation, I have seen Dr. Devi Prasad Pal, Mr. Arun Bajoria. In criminal, I have seen Mr. Balai Ray, who later became Advocate General of West Bengal. He is now no longer there. Then we had Mr. Dipankar Gupta, which is father of Mr. of Jaidi, uh, who was Advocate General. Of course, I have not seen him as Advocate General, but as uh, because he was Advocate General, I think, in 1976 or something. Uh, but uh, he was a towering figure. 
and we would all flock to a court to listen to his arguments, which were so logical, chiseled, and uh, methodical. Uh, then uh, in constitutional law, uh, apart from my senior, uh, I have uh, worked with and benefited a lot from Mr. Samaraji Topal, senior advocate, whose wife was a judge of the Supreme Court, Justice Ruma Pal. Uh, so basically, these are the persons whom I have seen and have benefited and I have admired. And so far as Supreme Court is concerned, I have worked very closely in my junior days with Mr. Venugopal, Mr. Ashok Desai, uh, then uh, uh, various other persons, but these two in many matters. And then uh, I have worked uh, with, of course, he's much junior, but then I have worked along with Mr. Ganesh also in, tax, in taxation, K.R. Ganesh in taxation recently. And uh, then, uh, you know, in the earlier days, even Mr. Fali Nariman, uh, we have gone for matters, we have gone for opinions. Mr. Soli Sorabji, right from the days when he had his uh, chamber in Sundarnagar. Later on, of course, uh, I have also been to Niti Bhav. Uh, but uh, uh, those, those were days. Mr. Parasaran, uh, <clears throat> I have worked with, I have attended his, his conferences and all that. Mr. Chidambaram. Uh, all these persons I have always admired uh, for their knowledge, for their uh, you know, style of addressing court, for their decorum, their personality, everything. This is broadly, you know. Indeed, sir. You have given a lot of names uh, for our viewers. Uh, by searching their name only, they will be inspired and they will learn a lot, including the Doyne sitting with us today. You, sir. Yeah, no, Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, now, sir, with uh, the last question, I would like to end uh, the first phase of questions. It, yes. it is quite general. Uh, to ask, uh, what aspects yes. of being an advocate interests you the most? Uh, see, as an advocate, uh, the job is always very challenging because you are there to get relief for your client. And you are being opposed by an equally or more intelligent mind. Yeah. Uh, so it's very much a battle of wits, a battle of knowledge. Uh, and then there is the judge who has to be kept in mind because ultimately he is going to write the judgment. So uh, it's a very challenging you know, task to present your views, overcoming the challenges of your opponent and, uh, you know, reading the judge's mind as to what he wants. And at the end of the briefs a lawyer to get relief, not to uh, know how erudite he is. So, you know, at the back of the mind, it is always there that I should get the relief for my client, uh, overcoming all the challenges, the intellectual challenges, other challenges. Uh, that's why advocacy is a great art. And advocacy is distinct from being a mere lawyer. There is a difference between a lawyer and an advocate. A, a person can be a very good lawyer across the table, but he may not be such a good advocate in court when he's a, lit a litigation counsel arguing a matter. Uh, I can tell you a short story, like uh, one of my senior colleagues who is now no, no more, um, he once said that somebody told him that he was educated in the University of Cambridge. So somebody told him that your accent of English uh, depends or differs from judge to judge, depending on the background of the judge so that you make yourself intelligible to the page. So that is advocacy. That's the challenge, that you have to present your version in an intelligible manner to a person and persuade him to treat
try and persuade him to hold in your favor. That's the aspect which uh, is very interesting for me. Apart from the fact that when you are arguing a matter, you uh, have to, you know, get ready thoroughly in all aspects, on all aspects of the legal issues involved in your matter, whether some decisions are against you or in your favor, uh, doesn't matter. You have to get thoroughly ready. And in the process also, you enrich your knowledge. Uh, and, uh, well, it's a very satisfying experience. You derive a lot of thrill out of, you know, reading the law, getting ready. Actually, I do. Uh, when I read a new judgment. In my junior days also, I used to get a thrill when I would read, say, a judgment of Lord Denning. Or in India, uh, judges like Justice Pasanjali Shastri, Justice Ayatollah, Justice uh, Gajinder Gatkar, Justice Subarao. So, uh, overall, you know, uh, that, that's the thing which uh, attracts me and gives me a lot of satisfaction. All right, sir. That's quite uh, great to know about you and interacting with you, sir. Uh, now, thank you so much, sir, for uh, uh, patiently answering all the questions posed thank by you. me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for hosting. All right, sir. Yeah. Uh, now, I would like to call upon Jyoti Prakash Datta, who is our co-founder, uh, for yes. dealing with the second phase of questions that he has with him. So, Jyoti yes. Prakash, please. Yes. Thank you, Devasis, for asking so many Good relevant evening. questions. Good evening, sir. Welcome back, sir. And uh, thank you, Devasis, for asking so many relevant questions. And I must thank, sir, for answering so lucidly to each and every question posed by you. Thank you, sir. Thank you again. Thank you. Sir, may I start the second phase? Yes, please do. Please do. Sure, sir. Sir, as we have dealt with your experiences, uh, your experiences as an advocate, as senior advocate, and uh, your anecdotes. Now we'll deal with some advisory parts, and especially to what to, you will advise to the younger generations. So, uh, as you had decided to study law in your time, and you can see now there is a huge influx of students who are willing to study law. There is a yes. huge demand for the profession of law. Yes. So, do you feel there is any difference? Uh, between your time and our time in the legal profession? Yes, uh, there is a lot of difference uh, because I would say that uh, today, uh, maybe due to the demand, uh, <clears throat> very more serious and, uh, you know, intellectually superior uh, persons or students are joining the law schools. And the infrastructure has also improved. Uh, so the law graduates who are coming out of the law schools are have, you know, they, they, they have been exposed to a very wide spectrum of uh, subjects uh, like uh, intellectual property, like uh, maritime law, like uh, various other fields. That I, the quality I find has definitely improved. But at the end of the day, my suggestion to litigation lawyers who join the profession, I'm not saying about the persons who take up employment in corporates. Uh, the litigation lawyer would be that the basics remain the same. You have to be hardworking. You have to be focused. You have to be serious. You have to sacrifice a large part of your personal life uh, while pursuing the profession, if you want to attain success, you must be under a good senior who will, under whom you can hone your skills. You can have, you know, your legal knowledge chiseled for uh, meeting any situation. Uh, so there is no substitute for hard work, apart from, I would say, uh, yes, a 10% luck factor in the profession, that will always be there because the breaks have to come and you have to grab the breaks. Uh, so that is that is there, but there is no substitute for hard work under guidance. Uh, yes, as I said, law schools have 
churned out uh, persons of better quality in large numbers. It's not that, you know, there were not good lawyers earlier or that uh, people who used to join, they're all bad. But then uh, now, you see, because of the improvement in infrastructure in the various premier law schools of the country, uh, the quality has definitely, definitely improved, but they require proper channeling. Uh, one flip side of uh, the premier law schools, which I have experienced, is that uh, so far as the litigation law is concerned, the courses in the law schools uh, do, are not always in sync with what uh, a lawyer would encounter after joining the profession. Like, you know, uh, I have found that in some law schools, a whole lot of importance is given to uh, branches of law, which may not be very relevant for the majority of the litigants. Now, the common man, uh, like, uh, while you can have an academic interest, but uh, if your focus, say, is on international maritime law, then in normal courts, in ordinary courts, uh, that would not come to any use. And uh, you will be sort of floating, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in an, or rather living in an ivory tower, uh, while there is no, you know, practical application of that. So I think the law schools have to be a little more sensitive uh, in, you know, encouraging students to learn those branches of law which touch the common man in their daily lives, like land laws, like, uh, say, tenancy, like, uh, you know, partition, because these are the areas which affect a common man. A common man will not be affected, perhaps, by uh, a provision in the GST. But uh, the litigant at large would uh, require help and assistance in their day-to-day -day lives. So, simultaneously with encouraging, uh, you know, exotic subjects like intellectual property, maritime law, admiralty, etc., arbitration, of course, arbitration is very important because it's a, an alternative dispute redressal mechanism. Uh, the law schools have to uh, be a little, uh, you know, more upfront and more active in uh, promoting consciousness of laws which touch the lives of the people in their daily lives. Very rightly said, sir. Uh, this focus hasn't shifted to certain subjects of law like maritime law as you uh, yeah. correctly pointed out and there are several other laws like space law sports law right. these are the laws which yes sir. these are the laws no, no, which... they are important like cyber laws are very important but then at the same time uh, if we are now talking every day even the supreme court is talking about access to justice and access to justice to the common man so i think the legal fraternity has to Gear, gear up for, you know, that kind of laws also, which uh, will be relevant for the common man. Indeed, sir. It is a very great advice. And I think the authorities who are listening to us today, they will definitely adopt this advice and they will accordingly design their purpose. Indeed, sir. And sir, after that, as we know, there is a system called moot court and trial advocacies. So, sir, do you think these systems are very relevant to the present day law school situations? Do they really improve the skills of uh, young lawyers or young law students? Yes, I have no quarrel with moot courts because after all, moot courts uh, give you at least some minimum exposure to what you would experience later on. Uh, may not be a complete replica, may not be an ideal simulator, but then it gives uh, you uh, an idea. And if you say, take up a particular subject or a particular case law, celebrated decision, 
and give the facts to the both sides and make them argue, then of course their legal skills get honed. Like, uh, for example, we in our college days, we have organized uh, such a moot courts ourselves with the help of the faculty by inviting judges from the high courts. Uh, say we take up the Minerva Mills case and uh, give the facts. Facts were given to us and there were we were divided into two teams uh, representing the petitioner and the government and uh, asked to argue before. And the judges, uh, although they were uh, informal judges in a moot court, they were quite tough. So they would put all the tough questions to you. That uh, I think uh, prepares you to a large extent to face uh, questions, to face a bench, to face a hostile judge, to face hostile questions and answer them, which uh, you have to encounter at uh, some point of time in your professional career. So moot courts, I would, uh, I, I personally speaking, I am all for moot courts. There is no reason why moot courts should be uh, downplayed. Uh, even trial advocacies, as you said. You know, because uh, it may not be, be very relevant for a person who, has, who is determined to go into a company and work. But then uh, it is very, very relevant for a person who will take up uh, litigation as a profession. Right, sir. Right. And after that, sir, uh, as we know, in a lawyer's life, researching and reading judgments are very important. Yeah. So... What would be your advice to the younger generation? How they should read the judgments? Uh, should they read the judgment in entirety or they should only read the ratio decidendi? What would be your advice to them, sir? Uh, you see, a ratio decidendi of a judgment uh, is a very flexible concept. You can't appreciate the ratio unless you know the facts. Because, as you know, a very cardinal principle of reading a judgment, even of the highest courts, like our Supreme Court or the say, US Supreme Court or other courts, is that, you know, the ratio consists of the issues which were necessary to be decided, which were raised and argued. That is the ratio. Now, to that is laid down, I think, since time immemorial in that famous judgment where uh, I think Lord Halsbury delivered the judgment in the House of Lords, Queen versus Lethem. Uh, so, to appreciate the ratio, you can't do it, uh, you know, by having a truncated view of the judgment. You have to read the judgment in the entirety, even the facts to come to a conclusion as to whether, you know, this point was really raised or was it necessary to be raised in the facts of the case? Because at the end of the day, every enunciation of law uh, is based on a certain factual premise. Uh, every, you know, no case is decided in vacuum. So um, uh, facts will be there. Ratio is what binds. Ratio is what important. What is, what is important. But, uh, you know, to appreciate what is the ratio, you have to read the entire judgment. Because as a professional lawyer, uh, you may be, you know, your opponent may cite a judgment and cite a paragraph out of it. And you may have to distinguish it. Now, to distinguish that, you have to appreciate in what factual scenario that judgment was delivered and how those facts are completely different from the facts of your case. Then only you can say that this judgment is factually, distingu is factually distinguishable. Uh, like, you know, um, there are other principles like Queen and Lethem, like they say that you don't read a judgment like a statute or like Euclid's theorems. Uh, now, uh, that being the position, if it is not an Euclid's theorem, the factual part is also important. And therefore, uh, the lawyer, while preparing, while reading, uh, should read the whole of the judgment and not uh, uh, you know, a paragraph of it or two paragraphs of it, which contain some broad enunciations of law. Because after, at the end of the day, that enunciation may not be very opposite in the facts of your case. So you must have a macro view. 
indeed sir we have to read the facts so as to appreciate the ratio in a better way yes indeed sir and sir after that another important aspect of advocacy is drafting so what would be your advice to younger generation of lawyers regarding drafting as you are you are a senior advocate it is not your duty to draft as of now but in previous days you must have drafted so many petitions and so many applications so what would yes. be your advice yes drafting is a very very important aspect of your training as a lawyer um uh, it is rewarding intellectually and in the junior stage it is also rewarding commercially because at your junior stage nobody is going to entrust you with uh, hearing briefs and drafting is the process through which you learn and also earn you will be briefed for drafting which will be settled by your senior uh yes drafting is very important and uh, for drafting you have to have a thorough view of the facts of your case the law involved in the case because you know your factual narration has to be ultimately dovetailed into the legal uh, questions which you will be ultimately espousing to ask for relief from the court so at the drafting stage only uh, the draftsman has to know the entire facts and the entire law uh, and he or she must be in a position to marshal facts very efficiently uh, and uh, of course one aspect has to be kept in mind that uh, the drafting should not be prolix it should be brief to the extent possible uh, it should have clarity it must uh, be intelligible it should be such that it can be understood by a simple reading of it by any person any slightly legally trained mind and uh, you know uh, somebody sometimes you know people who have a very good background of uh, english literature suppose he was a student of english honors or something like that they have a tendency to put in a lot of uh, english language uh, you know flavor into the drafting but that should, should be avoided the english has to be correct the english has to be clear but the english need not be very you know uh, poetic or uh, should not be that verbose because you are not writing a poetry when you are drafting a pleading or or are you writing a novel when you are drafting a pleading so you have to avoid that now in our younger days we when we joined our chambers we are always on the first day you join a senior chamber you would be given a book called book on drafting called bullen and leak and uh, the senior would ask you that uh, study the various forms for plain written statements etc etc uh, <clears throat> now of course that uh, those were excellent uh, examples of uh, or rather models of drafting but uh, it has also changed over the time because those were the days when you had very very precise pleadings they used to say that a pleading is a work of art it should be very short uh but nowadays in the practical field that does not always work because uh, the judges sometimes feel that you have not stated enough uh to make out your cause of action so there has to be a balance uh but you know you need not be unnecessarily uh, you know lengthy but uh, at the same time you must state all the essential facts and some uh, foundations of law also which will ultimately get you the relief in writ petitions you plead law to a large extent also in plaints you do not really plead evidence or you plead the law but even there you know whatever you plead you have to have the law at the back of your mind so that you know your pleadings are in sync with the applicable that is a great advice sir and in this advice you have given several pointers so if i can briefly state that you have said we have to focus on the facts of the case 
so you have to understand what are the facts and we have to summarize the facts in an understandable manner then we don't have to use english verbs we have to use simple english so as right. to make the judge as well as the parties understand about the facts of the case right. and whatever we are stating we have we have to keep some law to back that particular fact right and it's right right you have summarized so, perfectly <laughs> thank you sir thank you i think it it will be helpful to each and every person who are watching us today and after that sir uh, as uh, we have seen uh, in the first phase of the interview you have mentioned that you had a great interest in company and commercial laws but uh, while studying in the law school you shifted your interest somewhat to constitutional law and administrative law so sir uh, in the first phase of illegal advocacy and in the advocacy life people are tend to choose a particular area of law for the legal profession is it the right way or the people who are joining in the legal profession and uh, or who are in the first phase of their profession they should take whatever comes their way yes you know uh, <clears throat> i'll start by saying that you can make a broad division into criminal law and civil law that you can you know even a beginner can decide that no i will practice civil law so i will not practice criminal law. he can he need not if he is well versed in both many good lawyers are well versed in both but he can make a choice that broad choice but uh, within say civil law which encompasses so many areas everything is civil law uh, a junior should not uh, be very choosy or should not start specializing uh, in an area at a very early stage because what happens is that uh, you know some areas of civil law which constitute the fundamentals of law and which will be relevant in every branch of law they are ignored to a large extent suppose you are practicing income tax and you are uh, you have uh, you know you are concentrating totally on the income tax act and the principles of taxation now even in that field to attain success you know you have to know the fundamentals of civil law generally because you will encounter many situations while practicing income tax well when knowledge of civil law will become very relevant suppose you are dealing with a question of taxation implications of a transfer of property in that case the law relating to property how title passes when title passes what what is a mortgage what is a lease these questions uh, often arise and a person who has a good grounding in basic civil law as a general will benefit or rather will feel comfortable even in his area of specialization but if he has chosen to specialize from the very beginning he will flounder uh, when he is confronted with a question as to when the title passed he will have to then go back to the basics and start looking for it that uh, that let me see what is there in the transfer of property act and all that so i my advice is that not to go for a strict specialization at the very beginning do a mixed bag uh broadly you can classify into civil and criminal uh, but do a mixed bag at the beginning for a few years at least and so that you have a good grounding in the basic fundamentals of uh, all aspects of law and then you know if you go for specialization then there is no difficulty of course these are the days of specialization people like to hire lawyers who are specialized in a particular field but uh, to in the process of grooming yourself as a lawyer uh i think uh, your practice should be broad based to start with and later you know you can channel it into any field you like absolutely right sir and sir as we know you have practiced in the kolkata high court as well as in other courts over yes. several decades yes so from these several decades of advocacy what are the greatest lessons that you have learned and you want to share with young generation of lawyers you see 
uh, first of all, there is a difference between practicing in the high courts and uh, practicing or rather arguing a matter in the Supreme Court. Uh, this is because of the reason that uh, the procedure and the practices are a little different in the Supreme Court. Now, suppose you are doing a miscellaneous matter at the SLP stage or a writ admission like Article 32. Uh, the situation is a little different from what obtains in the High Court. First of all, the judges in the Supreme Court, they read the papers on a miscellaneous day uh, at their residences and come with some sort of a notion and some idea about what the matter is and what they propose to do. Now, if uh, they have already decided in your favor, fine. But if they have decided against you, you have to overcome that. But you get very little time to do that. So you yourself have to be focused on your best point or your best fact. And uh, so that within two minutes, you can bring the judge to your best point and, you know, uh, get an order. This is not necessary in most of the high courts because there, even at the admission stage, even at the miscellaneous stage, uh, the judges give you more time. So, uh, you know, you can take your time to make the judge understand, to present your case before the judge. But in the Supreme Court, at the admission stage, you don't get that time. So, you know, you have to be absolutely ready and choose your one or two best points to, you know, highlight uh, within two, three, four minutes or five minutes, whatever you give. You don't even get five minutes uh, before some judges. Uh, so, you know, the level of preparation has to be a little higher. Uh, even for hearing matters, uh, the level of preparation in the Supreme Court, I have found, uh, has to be a little higher because, you know, the judges, uh, maybe the judges are more experienced, number one. Number two is that, you know, a judge of the Supreme Court uh, is very conscious of the fact that he is the last court in the country and there is no further appeal. So he, some judges become a little too assertive uh, uh, by saying that, well, this is what we think about it. So your level of preparation accordingly and your abilities of persuasion have to be in sync with that, you know, to overcome such situations. Uh, because you have to acknowledge that they are the highest court of the land. They have even the power under Article 142, which nobody else has. So they can justify almost everything under the sun by recourse to Article 142. So it's a different approach. So it's, arguing before the Supreme Court is a slightly different approach. So far as high courts are concerned, uh, there is not much of a difference. The basic rules of advocacy apply that you have to be thorough, you have to be courteous. At the same time, you have to be firm with the judge. Uh, you should be ready with your facts to meet any question from the judge. If, uh, you know, you if you have an answer, of course, there may be some question to, you don't have, to which you don't have an answer. But then uh, it is... Basically, I think uh, getting ready and arguing the matter. But uh, something more is necessary in the Supreme Court. That's why I made the differentiation. I have not, I have found the high courts functioning all over India, uh, you know, is more or less the same. There's some, some difference may be there. Some judges may be a little different and all that. Some are more, uh, you know, proactive, some not so proactive, some are very vocal, some not so vocal, but then that is bound to happen with a human being. So, uh, as I see it, that uh, thoroughness is necessary across the board, but for Supreme Court, your level of preparation and your presence of mind and your ability to react to a situation has to be high. Indeed, sir. It is the final court of justice in the country. So yes. one has to be more circumspect and one has to be more cautious 
while arguing before the Supreme Court of India, right? Indian sir. And sir, as we are uh, approaching the last leg of this interview, I have only a couple of questions for you. The first question is, apart from advocacy, what do you prefer to do in your leisure time? What are your hobbies and free time jobs? Yeah. Uh, you see, ever since I joined the legal profession, of course, in my childhood, I had many hobbies, like collecting stamps and coins and all that. But uh, that I do not pursue that now very seriously. Uh, my co-curricular activities, or rather my pastime, uh, is uh, taken up by reading books, non non-legal books. Uh, I have a great interest in, you know, uh, in, in 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 world history, uh, political history, and uh, say constitutional history of some countries because you know uh, the constitution of a country is a product of its history. The constitutions of are all framed, keeping the history of the country in mind, what the country has gone through. So how many battles it has gone through, how many movements it has gone through, uh, like the American constitution, you know, the civil rights and how the slaves were treated and all that, you know, those backgrounds. So I have a great interest in history as a general and uh, the political history. And uh, I also have uh, some interest, you can say, in political science, because I like to study political systems, uh, uh, how they have worked and all that. I have a general interest in how battles were fought, you know, World War II and uh, Hitler and Nazis and uh, the left uh, and China and Russia and all that. So that reading takes up a lot of time. Uh, then I am interested in music. Uh, it's, of course, uh, you know, uh, 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 music of the conservative type. Uh, and um, uh, uh, so I enjoy that also, listening to good music uh, and, uh, uh, well, spending some time on social media also. You know, nowadays, social media also takes up some time, like Facebook and other things. They, they have their, up, they, they have their you know, pros and cons, a lot of pros and a lot of cons. So, uh, but then it has become an inalienable part of one's life. So not much, but a little bit of time on social media, but mainly reading and music and travel during vacations. Of course, till I retire, my travel will be confined only to traveling during vacations. So, but then I utilize the vacations for travel. I love to travel. Nowadays, of course, I'm getting old. So, uh, you know, gradually uh, I feel some difficulty some, sometimes, but then generally I love to travel. Indeed, sir. These are great hobbies and we have seen you very active in social media and I have been lucky enough to be rectified by you uh, over social media sites, I can say. Oh, thank I you so much. Posts. Thank Indeed, you for sir. the compliments. Indeed, sir. It is my honor to be rectified by a genius like you, sir. It, it, it is no, really no, no, no. great yeah. to see uh, that persons like you, despite of so many watts and such a hectic schedule, you find some time for social media and you also uh, provide some advices to the younger generation over the social media. We have seen also that. Whenever I see that, you know, something uh, needs to be said, I try to put it across. That's all. Right. Right. And we really appreciate that approach of yours. Sir. Thank and you. the last question of this session, if you will be given a chance to go back to your law school, do you uh, think that you have any regret that you want to change something from your student career? Well, uh, if I have to go back to my law school as it stood in the year, say, 1982, 83 or 81, uh, I would not like to change myself, but I would like the law school to change. Because as I told you, in those days, the infrastructure was not that great. So I would like to see a law school with a very well-stocked library, 
with a very serious and capable faculty, uh, modern tools of study uh, with emphasis on technology and, uh, you know, a better atmosphere. Uh, but I think uh, that uh, as at present, we have already, uh, you know, made a lot of progress there. And if I am told to go back to my law school as it exists today, uh, well, I would say that uh, the situation is much better, although I will like perhaps to have further improvements in the system uh, with more, you know, uh, interactive uh, sessions between the students and the teachers and uh, more exposure to, uh, say, uh, debates and moot courts and um, uh, even debates and moot courts which are organized in other countries. Like, you know, uh, I was going through the website of the National uh, University of uh, Singapore Law School and I was amazed to find the kind of interactions they have with all other law schools all over the world. So that is an area, I think, which gives a lot of exposure to the students. I would like to, you know, but for myself, I would not uh, say that I would uh, change, I like to change something about me because I have enjoyed my law school. And uh, so far, I have been quite uh, satisfied and happy. That's really nice to know, sir. It is really right. nice to know that you want to change the system of your times because yes. those were the days when infrastructure was not that much good. And we are really privileged as a generation. We are really privileged to have these kind of infrastructures. We have research tools. We have yeah. extended libraries. So yeah. these are really boon for us. So with that, sir, we uh, take your permission to end this particular session. It was really a nice session with you, sir. We have interacted uh, with you very uh, lucidly and also actively. We have uh, got to know many things about your life, your career as an advocate and after that as a senior advocate. And you have given so many advices to the younger generation of lawyers and students. And I'm sure, I am and Devas is uh, very sure that those advices are going to help a lot of people in the future. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, you so for much. Thank you. Thank both of you and also the viewers. And I pray that the viewers as well as yourselves have a very good uh, Diwali and a very enjoyable uh, festive season, which is coming. Wish you the same, sir. Thank you. Have a prosperous Thank you. life. Thank you, sir. Thank you.